Well, good afternoon to everybody, and a warm welcome to songwriters and lovers of songwriters, which we all are, we're not songwriters. I'm John Bittrick, longtime veteran in finance and banking for the creative industries, as well as being a classically trained musician. I am so proud to ally with the Sona Foundation as a founding board member and chief financial officer. I believe it's vitally important to protect music creators and their families through impactful programs that support mental, emotional, and by no means least, financial well-being. Today's interactive session between the audience and the panelists represents our first session in the Sona Foundation's financial wellness program, targeted towards the long-term creation of value and wealth for songwriters and their families, whatever their backgrounds and circumstances. We really want to reach everyone in the community. I would like to thank our program sponsor, City National Bank, and veteran entertainment banker, Denise Coletta, for their support of the Sona family since in its inception and their alignment with our community and mission. Denise has been a tremendous ally to everyone in the music industry for so many years. Thank you also to our dear friends Barbie Quinn and BMI for sponsoring the presentation at their wonderful new offices in the Rolex building here in Beverly Hills. And, and I hear a rumor that there are Rolexes in the gift bags. <laughs> but maybe I'm mistaken. Don't hold me to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Today is the first of our four sessions in the Music and Money Seminar Series. Our goals are long term. And these sessions are meant to build upon each other to support long term financial decision making by songwriters and their advisors. This first session, Financial Planning for the Music Creator, will lay the foundation for the next three sessions and will be an introduction to personal financial planning. We'll touch on elements to consider building a team of trusted advisors, proven strategies. Session two, which, which should be scheduled sometime in the next three or four months, will focus on building, managing, and passing on personal and business wealth. Session three will be focused on building the value of your music catalog. And session four will be dedicated to discussions on diversifying your personal investment portfolio. The financial wellness content presented at this seminar is for informational purposes only and in no way should be relied upon for financial advice. Please consult your own financial advisor before making investments or other major decisions regarding your finances. The presenters, BMI, Sona, and the Sona Foundation, and City National Bank are not your investment advisors or business managers and should not be relied upon as such. I'd now like to introduce our wonderful panel um, I'd like to first introduce entertainment, entertainment attorney, Lindsay Arrington. And Lindsay is a partner at LaPolt Law. You all might know that Dina LaPolt is a stalwart supporter of the mu music community and wa was key in crafting the Music Modernization Act. And Lindsay, has been a star performer since she began at, at LaPolt Law. She specializes in matters related to electronic music, endorsements, and independent labels. She's passionate about helping the firm's clients navigate new and cutting edge opportunities, including NFTs and blockchain music distribution, music related software, and game development, and startup streaming services. At LaPolt Law, Lindsay negotiates all varieties of, agree of agreements relating to the music industry, as well as endorsement and social media agreements for influencers, entrepreneurs, and professionals across 
the entertainment industry. And next, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague of many years, Denise Coletta. And Denise um, has been in the banking industry for over 30 years. She's the senior vice president at City National Bank, which, if you're not aware, is really the entertainment bank covering film, television, and music um, on Billboard's, Billboard's 2023 power list. Denise was recognized and honored as one of the top executives shaping the music business today. This followed on Billboard's 2022 recognition of Denise as one of the top women in music executives. In 2017, she was honored by Variety as one of the honorees on the Power of Women LA list and was the only banker to make the list. Denise oversees a large portfolio of loans and deposits, totaling about $2 billion at City National Bank. And she and her team provide new financing to various genres of media and music industries. Hey, Denise. Next, I'd like to introduce Kay Hanley. And we especially wanted Kay to be part of this presentation to show us the perspective of a music creator. So we didn't want to have just financial executives or attorneys. We wanted somebody to talk about her own journey in, um, in looking at her finances, finances, managing her finances. And so I think she'll have some valuable advice for us. Kay is a Peabody and Emmy Award winning songwriter co-founder of Songwriters of North America, an advocacy organization focused on preserving the value of music and songwriter rights through legislative policy. And um, Kay has played a key role in crafting some of those endeavors and some of that policy. Sona was instrumental in passing the Music Modernization Act, which created the Mechanical Licensing Collective where Kay now serves as vice chair of the Unclaimed Royalty Oversight Committee. As a singer-songwriter, Kay is known for her work with her band, Letters to, to Cleo, and composing music for TV animation such as the hit Disney series Doc McStuffins, Cartoon Network, WB's DC, Superhero Girls, Harvey Girls Forever, and Ada Twist, Netflix scientist. Currently, Kay is executive producer of Disney Junior's upcoming Kindergarten, the musical. <laughs> so she's actually engaged in, in that. <laughs> Yay. Yay. And last but no by no means least of our panelists is my friend and colleague Mark Pariser. Mark is the CPA business manager and name partner with Dunn Pariser Perot and has over 30 years of experience providing tax services for entertainers. Mark's practice emphasizes the proactive management of the tax and financial affairs of a variety of people who work in film, television, music, and technology. His clientele also includes touring acts, international executives and entrepreneurs, and other high net worth individuals and their businesses. So first, I wanted to start out with the creative perspective with Kay. Um, we wanted to talk to Kay about setting up your goal, your goals and your financial habits. And I also wanted to mention that Kay has expertise in crypto markets and the digital world. So she and I have had a lot of sharing about digital platforms and, and how, to, how to understand the value of investing in those markets as well. So she's quite conversant with that, that world. But Kay, let's first talk about 
how to build a financial advisory team. What would you say were the important first steps in your journey to building a team to support you? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. I think it's really hilarious that I am sitting here with such esteemed company. Um, I, I started out my life as a musician in a rock band in Boston in the 90s where considering yourself as part of like even caring about the business part of the music business was uh, frowned upon, <laughs> really. Um, so the idea that I would even have any, any opinion about this stuff is kind of funny. Um, and it took me really, uh, you know, growing up having kids, actually making some money at this stuff to be like, oh, wait a minute. This is a business, <laughs> and, uh, and I need to keep the lights on, and I have mouths to feed, and uh, wait, maybe people should be paying me for what I do. Maybe this is, val maybe, maybe I do have a valuable skill. So um, if I had to do it all over again, what I know now is that at the very beginning, the first people that a person needs to have in place is a CPA, someone who really understands um, how to help you file your taxes, um, because the money coming in for a songwriter or a recording artist is generally not taxed. And so um, if you are not paying your taxes as you go, you are going to get, you're going to be sad <laughs> eventually, if not immediately, someday. <laughs> So you're going to want to find yourself a CPA. You're also going to want to find yourself um, a good music attorney. And it actually, it doesn't even have to be a great music attorney. Just a music attorney. <laughs> As you're, no, a good music attorney. Um, because when you are making those, even those baby deals at the very beginning, um, you're going to want to be in the habit of having someone take a look at those. Don't think that you are smart enough to just be like, oh, this looks good, or I'm sure it's fine. It's my friend who's doing the deal. I have found that it's even more important when you're doing deals with friends because um, friendships can be, can get really, really, um, can get really bamboozled in, in this business. And if you can protect your friendships, uh, which are, are, it's really important that you do that with a lawyer. So lawyers, CPAs, and uh, yeah, that would be my advice. Okay, great. And what early career habits do you think people should foster when they're, when they're first starting their careers? You, you gave us some, some clues, but are, are there any other insights you can offer us? Yes. Um, oh, a really good habit to get into. Well, first of all, when you're, you are a songwriter, like kindergarten, kindergarten songwriter, just basic, basic, sign up for a PRO. And, you know, whether it's BMI, I mean, look at this. It's like you, when, when you are just writing your very first songs, you can be rolling in the, like in beautiful offices like this with your peers, like right out of the gate. Um, and get in the habit early of like whenever you write a song, just in your bedroom, anything that you write, just get in the habit of registering that song title with your PRO, whether it's BMI or ASCAP, just whatever it is, just be in the habit of doing that. And um, because even if you're not getting paid now, you will someday. Um, that, that would be probably like the most important habit to get into early on as a songwriter, just kindergarten basics. Okay. Now I'd like to go into your own personal history. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so from the standpoint of good as well as ill experiences, bad mm -hmm. experiences, in your own experience with team building, specifically around the business entrepreneur, entrepreneurial elements, mm -hmm. 
um, and financial elements, what kind of advice could you give to songwriters, especially budding songwriters, about how to build trust with a team of advisors? Who to trust, who not to trust, right. and who not to just surrender yourself to? That is a really good question, John. Um, so I think it's kind of, Im it's, it's important not to, you know, especially now when there's, uh, you know, when I was coming up, you would never, I feel lucky in a way that you would never just like hand over your business to some guy, you know? It's like you would, you, we really, really wanted to hold on to control for as long as, as we could. So my, my, my advice would be to not get over your skis. If you, um, <laughs> number one, keep your day job. <laughs> um, if, just because you get a $50,000 advance for your, just because you're being offered a $50,000 advance from your publisher. Um, let's just say that you do, well, first of all, congratulations, that's amazing. And that means that you're really doing something right. And, uh, and sock that money away, put it in the bank, and go back to work the next day <laughs> if you have a job. I mean, that's what I did. You don't have to do that. That's what I did. Um, and, and keep control of that money. I, I would not run out and get a business manager right away. Not right away. Thanks, Mark. Understood. I knew you would understand. By the way, Mark is my business manager. But uh, now, I'm, but I'm 54, and I've been doing this for 35 years professionally. So um, I, I would hold on to the reins of your money, the money that's coming in, the money that's going out. Keep control of the checkbook for as long as you can, you know? And but. But be, but while being realistic, you know, if things start to feel more complicated than you are able to handle, then you can start bringing people in. At, you know, that CPA that you have been engaging for your taxes might be a good person to ask about, you know, is it time for me to consider a business manager? And maybe there is a business manager that that person, that, 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 is employed that employs the CPA. Um, I know for a fact that Mark's firm has many wonderful CPAs, and he is a wonderful CPA. Um, I have also had the experience of when we were starting, when my band was starting out, um, we were getting, our band was getting paid, and um, <laughs> our guitar player was getting the checks, and the checks were coming to the band under his social security number. And um, so what that <laughs> meant was like, after a couple years, all of the, all the checks that the band was getting paid were going to his social security, like it was coming in as like his income. So at some point, as a songwriter, recording artist, performer, whatever it is, extricate the income that you are getting as a songwriter, performer, recording artist from your social security number. Set up a DBA, and, and I believe that you guys are gonna be covering this a little bit more, like a DBA, uh, you know, an S Corp, uh, an LLC, um, I can't tell you which one is best for you, obviously, but, but get your social security the heck out of it <laughs> as quickly as you can. Um, and then, um, you know, when it comes to, again, like when it comes to business managers and, and having like a, a staff of people around you, um, you know, just be, be careful about handing over the reins. You really want, in even when you do hand over the reins, make sure that you are actively involved in the money that's coming in and the money that is going out. It is your money, it's your business. And the people who are, you know, the Marks of the world are your partners, you know. He, Mark will take my, you'll take my call whenever I call. Absolutely. Yes. And, um, and, but I also have access to my bank accounts and I know what the, I know the money that is coming in and I also, I tell his, 
I tell his staff when to invoice and when to, you know, so it's like I'm in control of things anyway. Is, I think that, does that answer the question? Yeah, yes, because I, I wanted to hear your comments about the fact that you may have experts that are handling various elements of your business, but you still want to be involved. Trust but verify. You don't just want to give everything up to the experts. And Denise and I have had clients in the past that really did not observe what was going on with their banking yeah. or with their finances. And ultimately, the responsibility was with them. So trust can only go so far. In 2009, I did have an experience where um, I had a business manager who it turned out was, um, it, I didn't, it, I didn't end up doing so badly in this situation, but um, there was a downturn in the market at the in the aughts, and this business manager was apparently doing like pay, like stealing from Peter to pay Paul, and had also like taken out a bunch of like loan. Like I had stopped making as much money as I had, and he didn't want to tell me, and so he started like taking out loans from the bank to like pay for my bills and like it, it was insane it, it, it ended up um being a nightmare for years for me and i will it was a lesson that um i will never forget let's put it that way and i wanted to um ask you Kay, as a creative person do you feel you have an intuitive sense of who to trust and who not to trust um, not as a creative person, but being from, being from where I'm from, I, th I think being from Dorchester <laughs> makes me know who to trust and who not. And also growing up, you know, I, I, I grew up poor. My parents were terrible with money. And, um, and so when I made some, I always feel like it's, I always feel like I'm never going to make any more. Like, it's always the last. So I'm very careful about money, and I, I feel like it's it's a huge responsibility to have it. So, um, you know, and I want to have some to give to my kids. So to me, it's I, it, I never take it lightly that I have money. And I mean, not that I have a ton of money. You know, I have, I'm a working class songwriter. I'm, 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 you know, I, we, we, this is a company town and I am a working class worker. And, you know, I, 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 I definitely, I live in the middle class of Los Angeles doing a job. And um, to me, it's like, I don't just trust people. You know, I partner with people to take care of, things when I need certain, I don't, but I also don't pretend like I know how to do shit when I don't. You know what I mean? Precisely. Yes. Yeah, and I like your <laughs> phrase that you're partnering. Yes. With these advisors. Yes. Yeah, you still have a major role. Yes. Yes. Great. It's, it's, a, it's a co write Yes. You know? Yes, just make sure we get proper credit. Exactly, okay? everyone's getting a credit. <laughs> Okay, do you have any final words to say before I go on to, to Lindsay? I'm gonna let the smart people talk. Oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're pretty damn smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Kay. Thanks, John. She is a very smart lady, let me tell you. Um, let's turn to uh, our legal expert, Lindsay, and we definitely benefit from hearing her thoughts about the music attorney and client relationship. Lindsay, when do you think is the right time to reach out and establish a relationship with the music attorney? And a related question, how does the relationship between the attorney and the client develop over time? Yeah, so I think just like Kay said, you want to start reaching out as soon as you financially can. Obviously, if you're not making that much money, you're not going to be able to afford to pay someone else like a lawyer. And we don't work for free, unfortunately, <laughs> at least most of the time. 
So when you're looking at you know, signing your first publishing deal, I think that's like a really good time to say, okay, I need to sit down, I need to look for somebody. And there's, like Kay said, there's all levels of music attorneys. There are lower level, there's higher level. You don't necessarily have to go for the biggest name in the business right away. You can find a smaller, maybe solo practitioner or someone from a smaller firm that can work with you in a price range that makes sense. So a lot of times, especially with publishing deals, you may even be able to work your legal fees into the publishing deal and have your publisher pay those fees to your lawyer instead of you having to come out of pocket or come out of your advance. But definitely as soon as you're ready to sign like that big publishing deal, that's when you need to look towards a lawyer because you want to make sure that you're understanding what kind of deal you're getting into and not just relying on, oh, this is what the publisher said the terms are, and yeah, I can kind of read that, and that kind of makes sense. Like, there's a lot of nuance that goes into those deals, and that's a very uh, complex and good place for a lawyer to explain to you. Like, here's what it is, here's how long it's gonna happen, like, here's the advances, here's your royalties. So, I think that's, that's a good time. Okay, and... Um a question that we didn't talk about initially, but I, I'd like to pose to you because we were speaking about this issue this morning. Um, I know that LaPolt Law and Dina LaPolt, who's the star uh, of the firm, has always had an orientation with the creative person, person towards the creative person, and specializing in that rather than also handling corporate business. So could you tell us how that perspective um, works with clients and why it might be advantageous to deal with a firm like LaPolt versus another firm that has more relationships on the corporate side? Yeah, like, like you said, we only represent talent and talent side. So we don't represent any music companies unless, you know, one of our artists owns a record label. We might do that record label for them. But for the most part, we are client side, talent only. Um, and I think that perspective aligns us with your interests and we can really like relate to you and fight for you on that side. And Dean has been just a great advocate for songwriters and getting the Music uh, Modernization Act passed. So there's just, there's a lot more that you can relate to if you stick to one side or the other, I think. Okay. What advice would you give young songwriters to get their ducks in a row, all their their documentation, whatever they need to inform the attorney about when they're, when they're first establishing the relationship with you? Yeah, I think what you should definitely do from the very beginning is get in the habit of talking with your co-writers about splits and getting those in writing, even if that's just in a text message, in an email chain. If you wanna go above and beyond, you wanna go to the next step, you can find songwriter split templates. You just Google songwriter split template. Something will come up. It'll be just a single piece of paper. Usually you can write down, you know, I got 45%, so-and-so got 20%, so-and-so got 15 and you all sign that piece of paper. That's going to go a long way, even if it doesn't feel like, you know, you're making a lot of money right now or you haven't gotten that hit song yet you don't wanna wait until you've already had the hit song to have that discussion. Because then people's memories change, all of a sudden it's, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think I was getting 25, I, I was definitely getting 40. And then you've got overclaimed songs, nobody's getting paid, it disputes that go on years and years. I, we have clients right now that have huge, you know, top albums that have been out for five years and none of the splits are being paid out because everything is in dispute. <laughs> so get in the habit of doing it early, get those things, like I said, at least in writing, you know, if you don't wanna be the guy that shows up with the piece of paper to have everyone sign, at least get that in writing so that, you know, you have a record going back of what everybody got. Okay, great. Aside from the performing rights organizations, the PROs like ASCAP and BMI, what other societies should a songwriter register with? Yeah, so another big one is the MLC. That's the one that was just formed recently with the Music Modernization Act. That helps you match your royalties from digital service providers like Spotify, Apple Music. That will help you get paid on those songs. 
And then uh, also, of course, SONA and songwriting organizations. They're a great resource to be involved in and they can open doors for you and connect you with people and give you amazing presentations like this where you can learn about your business and, and yeah. Okay, great. And now, um, Lindsay, what would you say is important in structuring the relationship? Should, are, are you instrumental in advising the client in terms of structures that they might set up? Yeah. Corporate structures or other business entities? We can be. Our firm specifically does music related business, so I will help you negotiate your publishing deal. If you're a recording artist, I'll help you negotiate your record deal. I personally don't set up corporations. We have corporate attorneys that can help with that, or you know, even the business managers sometimes have firms that they will use. But we kind of act as the general counsel of the artist business, so to speak, where you might have a business manager and a manager as well. We all get together and you know, really help you grow and understand your business. And that's kind of like the role that we play. So especially when it comes to, like I said, signing a big publishing deal, you want to be involved in your business, like Kay said. And you want to be asking those questions. You don't want to just bring your deal to a lawyer and say, hey, I'm doing this deal. I think they said I was getting $50,000. Like, can you look at it and tell me if I should sign it? You know, you want to ask questions. You want to understand what's the term? How, how many songs am I required to deliver? Is this an MDRC deal? Is this a term of years? Like, how does all that work? How does the royalties work? Like, what do I get paid on sinks? What do I get paid on mechanicals? You know, and that's something that a lawyer can really help you, at least a good lawyer can really walk you through and make you understand and like be really aware of what your business is and like what deal you're making. Okay. Could you give us a short history of a real life situation with a client where they came in as a very young artist and then developed their careers, the, the years went on, and what sort of pitfalls were, were there and what were the developments, how did you assist them? Sort of talk a little bit about a career trajectory. Yeah, so I'm trying to think, we actually, we had a producer songwriter client who had done what I said not to do, which was sign a publishing deal without understanding what it was or having a lawyer like really explain it to them. And so, you know, he was, I think, two or three, maybe, maybe even four years into his deal, probably like two when we when we first started working with him. And didn't understand, you know, thought that, oh, it was only like a three or four year deal and then he would be out or he could renegotiate. And because he didn't understand where it was at, it was actually like an eight or nine year deal. By the time you really added up all the options, like all the contract periods, and when you're trying to renegotiate from the back end, it's a lot harder. You have to have a fair amount of success and even then, trying to renegotiate a deal, you're not going to get very much movement on it. So I think we, we ended up being able to get him like one of the contract periods knocked off, a little bit raised in the advances, stuff like that. But that kind of situation, we see a lot. And it's something that if you can try to avoid it from the beginning, like that's the best time to do it, is to get it from the beginning and get that deal that makes sense for you instead of having to go back and try to renegotiate it later. Okay, and then um, finally, I'd like to ask you, Lindsay, what has been your experience with the advocacy, the polit political advocacy on behalf of music creators that Dina has engaged in? Have you participated in that or other members of the firm as well? Yeah, other members of the firm a little more than I have. Um, to be honest, but we all try to pitch in where we can. Um, I've written a few articles for Dina, but that's about the extent of my <laughs> work on the advocacy side. Right, but your, your firm is known as being a staunch supporter of the, the community and really instrumental yeah. in, in crafting legislation in, in yeah. Washington. There's, there's so many issues and there's, there's stuff that, you know, we've got great success on. We got the Music Modernization Act passed. That was amazing, you know, but now we're looking at one of the hot topics right now is rap lyrics being used as evidence in a criminal case. 
So I don't know how many people have heard of this, but it is a really bad thing. And we're trying to get that to be not allowed at all across the entire country, so. Could you give us a little more detail yeah. about that? Because many people might not be aware of this case. Yeah, so it's essentially, you know, you say you rap in a song like, I went and shot up so-and-so's house. That might not be literal, right? You may be referencing another song. You may be making a metaphor. You may be even referencing someone else's experience. And people, certain prosecutors, are actually using that as evidence in real criminal cases as you admitting that you did something or you being involved in some kind of criminal activity. And it's like, well, you said that you were because of this song, like it's right here, you said it. <laughs> and it, it causes obvious problems, right? Because now you have to like, songwriters have to what, think about every single thing that they say and worry if you know it could come back to them in court. It's really chilling on freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Like, we want a we want an environment where you can say anything in a song and not worry about like this repercussion. Am I admitting to some crime that I did or didn't commit? So, and it's of course being used against black people primarily because that's the kind of country that we live in. So it's not only bad for everybody, but it's being used in just a really racial and negative way. Definitely speaks to artistic freedom and mm -hmm. social justice. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, any final words? No, I think Kay touched on it. Sign up for a PRO, get that low hanging fruit. If you're a recording artist, sign up for Sound Exchange. You know, it's really easy, it's free. You can register your songs on there and start collecting. Um, and if you're not to the point of where you're gonna have a publishing deal yet, you know, look into an administrator like Song Trust, Riptide. They can go out and help collect worldwide and bring in even more of that money for you for usually a pretty low fee. Okay, great. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. For now, let's turn to Mark Pariser, CPA and business manager, to discuss pertinent aspects for the songwriter in tax and estate planning, effective and transparent, transparent financial statements and tax documents. Mark, there are several options for business structures that an entrepreneur or creator can set up. Can you walk us through the, the most common for songwriters? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> typically, I see songwriters, the, the easiest thing is to set up a, a DBA. And the DBA, the initial stand for doing business as, so it's the songwriter, and they pick a name that they want their business identity to be. And y you, know, you file a statement with the county that says, okay, I'm gonna be doing business as so-and-so music. And then you register that with your, your PRO uh, or your publisher and you get checks in, in that name. From a tax standpoint, it's pretty simple. It's essentially an alter ego of yourself. Um, the next structure is a single member LLC and um, there are some legal protections with LLCs most of which I don't believe are really music re related. It, 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 so I, I am actually not a big fan of setting up single member LLCs for, um, for songwriters. Um, and then there are, there's also the corporate form that, that you can use. Um, and that's when you're rendering, I, I find that that's useful when you're rendering services where essentially you're you doing works for hire. So if, uh, you know, my composer clients that um, are doing work for, for TV shows or they're doing work for films, um, they use the corporation to render services and you get a lot of tax breaks with, with corporations. 
Um, corporations are audited less frequently than um, people who do not work through corporations. So a lot of times I, I do like using corporations. What, when, but there's a cost to that because now you're doing another tax filing. Um, when you're doing songwriting, you can go to your accountant and say, hey, I earned you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000, and here's a list of my expenses, and they throw it on a tax return, and you're done. Well, with a corporation, you actually have to have a bookkeeper because you need to keep accurate books and records. Um, it, it, so it's a more involved process having a corporation. So there's costs. Um, I, I like my clients to have their own insurance when they have a corporation, you know, insurance for the corporation, so there's another cost there. So, um, so it, I guess it really depends on what economic level you're at to, to determine whether you should have a corporation or not. So you think it's mainly your point, the point in your career that would determine what sort of structure yes. you should have? Yes, and also the type of work that you're, you're doing, too. As I, as I said, I, you, you know, I, I mean, I have composers, I've had composers that don't have corporations. And from a tax perspective, it actually ends up being fairly similar, uh, but they do get audited less. And what do you think the rationale is for that, why is there more attention paid to an individual rather than a corporation? There is a, I would say, an inherent bias against self-employed people um, at the taxing agencies. The, the presumption is, is oh, they've got to be, they've got to be skimping on the taxes some, somehow. <laughs> um, the truth is, is you can do just as much with a corporation in that regard as you could as an individual. <laughs> but, you know, corporations are a little more di difficult to audit. And Valuable hint. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you give us a tale, give us a, a story about um, a time when you handled a complex ownership structure when working with multiple songwriters? Well, um, <laughs> and, and you managed to keep them in the same room. <laughs> well, we we did it all by Zoom, so I didn't have that oh, that, okay. <laughs> that 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 problem. But um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about oh, uh, the situation that that we, go for it. That we worked I, on. I want to hear this. Okay. So it's very um, complex. <laughs> so so K is one member of a four songwriter team that's developing the show for Disney Kindergarten the musical and we had a lot of back and forth on what was the best format and uh, you know to what what worked made the most sense for taxes and um, so I had to talk with each of the not only did I talk with the four of them but then I went and talked with their four advisors because, well, one, it was the right thing to do, but two, we did have some debate over what the proper structure should be. And where we ended up is each of them have their own, what we call a loan-out corporation, which is a company that lends out your service, lends out your services. And so they each had their own loan-out corporations, and I wanted the loan-out corporations to be a member of the LLC that was doing the show. And and so just herding the cats to get there is 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 one instance. Okay, <laughs> okay, and give us a little more flavor about exactly how a loan-out loan out corporation is set up, the purposes, because people might not be familiar with that term. Okay. Um, it's essentially your professional service corporation. So what I mentioned earlier, there's that, that what I call a little bit of audit insurance. That's one of the main, that's a benefit of it. 
Um, you're getting your social security number off the income, like, like Kay said. It, it's now all corporate income. And you have the ability to determine what kind of salary you pay yourself. Uh, you can set up your own private pension. You could use it to fund your health insurance. So there is a lot of benefits to having the corporation. Okay, great. Would you say that the goal of tax planning is simply to minimize taxes, or are there other considerations that enter into the equation? Well, as Kay mentioned earlier, I don't like it when people are sad. <laughs> and and um, it, it's not fun to have to sit and tell somebody, oh, you owe $50,000 in, 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 in tax when they don't have it. So it's not only the, so there's a couple of things. One is obviously we want to minimize taxes. And having, working with somebody that's familiar with uh, music and film and television, it's important because, you know, we know what the deductions are. Um, but the other part of it is, you know, I've had artists get large advances. And the first thing that I do is I look at what they've got and I do a projection. I, I look and see, okay, what, what, what are the expenses going to be for the year? How much of that are tax deductible expenses? How much are personal? And I say, okay, you just got in, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars. This is where you're going to be in a year. This is what you're going to have to pay to the government. And, and this is when you're going to have to do it. And that's, that's critical. You, you can't just put your head in the sand and, and, and not deal with it. Okay, and Mark, could you provide in more detail, because our audience might not be aware, of the other services that business managers provide? So it's not just about tax planning and tax returns. No, um, a business manager is the quarterback of the financial team. So the other things I get involved with is, uh, let's say a client wants to buy a house. Well, I will work very closely with a bank. A lot of times it's City National Bank. And we will figure out what kind of mortgage makes sense, you know, whether we want it to be a 30-year fixed mortgage. Although with the interest rates are these days, I'm not do haven't doing too many 30-year fixed mortgages right now. But um, certainly when rates were really low, a lot of clients, when you could get in a 30-year mortgage and it be hovering around under 3%, we, I did plenty of those. Uh, so we get involved in mortgage financing, uh, car leasing. I work with car brokers. So this client wants a car, we help them get the car. Uh, estate planning. I don't do estate planning, but an estate planning is basically putting out a plan of who gets what if something happens to you and you're no longer here. So, uh, so I work with estate planners, and, and, and I guide the client through that process of setting up a, lit a living trust. Uh, I work with investment advisors. You are fortunate enough to have extra cash to invest. Who do you give it to? I mean, there's thousands of financial advisors out there. Not all of them are so good, so I act as a as a, as a screener for good financial advisors. Could you talk also about how the firm would handle the day-to-day -day operations of an entrepreneur or a business where that individual might not be comfortable or simply not have the time to focus on paying checks or making disbursements? Well, we have uh, teams that do the day-to-day -day bill pay and, and money collection. So usually we have an account manager and that account manager has an assistant and they take care of all the bill pay. So uh, and then my partners and I are the ones that are the ultimate approvers of the disbursements. So you know we do it luckily we do it all electronically but I remember the, the old days where I was physically signing checks. <laughs> 
but you know now it's all done on the on the computer but um, our purpose is to enable our clients to do what they do best which is create make music in engage in their art and we take care of the the financial part of their lives but I also want to you know agree with with Kay I much prefer it when a client is engaged in in their finances I, I have plenty of clients that just say you do everything I don't want to know about it and I will do that because that's what I do but it's it's much better for the client if they know what's going on and I think it gives you guys, it would give you guys a lot more comfort if you're aware of what's going on in your own financial lives. And when you're initially meeting with a client, how do you determine whether there's a good fit between the client and the firm? Because I'm sure you don't just accept every client that walks in the door. Well, um, there's a few things. There is definitely you know, a client has to have a certain income level in order, uh, as Lindsay said, we don't work for free, but, y y you know, so there has to be that. Um, and it could, and it's different, uh, client by client situation. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say this, I, I have a very strong no asshole <laughs> rule. <laughs> Life is too short. Yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I've I've worked with difficult clients before, um, and it's not fun. And part of this is not just about collecting money; it's about enjoying what I do. And so, so that's, that's. And it. I don't know how many of you are aware, but Mark is uh, has been recognized as one of the top business managers in the entertainment industry, in, in the music industry. So he's been lauded by his peers as well as his clients. Um, you. Did you have any final thoughts for us? Uh, final thoughts. Um, Not that I, we're I, canceling you. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, you know, we've said it a few times, and I just said it a few minutes ago, but I, it's, it is really important for you guys to be engaged in your, in your finances. I, you know, un unfortunately, uh, not everybody is good at what they do or does what they say that they're going to do. And, and I can almost guarantee that all the horror stories that you may have heard out there are be just because the client just thought it was being taken care of and it turned out it wasn't. So always be willing to ask questions and your business manager or CPA should be willing to answer those questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. We appreciate your thoughts. And next, I'd like to move on to my friend, Denise Coletta. Denise, as an entertainment banker, you are the connector to appropriate bank account structures, wealth management, cash management, credit facilities, foreign exchange transactions. And I don't think, having spent many years of my career in, in finance, in corporate banking, and entertainment banking, I know this very well that many people simply do not understand the range of activities that a banker enters into, especially, especially an entertainment banker. So they will be a key partner. It's really important for you to choose the right banker who understands the industry and its idiosyncrasies and someone that is truly client-focused. Um, Denise, would you please explain some of the different tools ava available to lend against royalties? Sure. Well, thanks, everyone, and happy to be here. And again, I'm a big fan of all of you, because I cannot do what all of you do, and, and I just so enjoy music. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so there are uh, different tools that 
particularly a songwriter, can use to engage in monetizing their intellectual property, particularly the writer's share. And uh, you know, there's two different tools, one being in advance, another being alone. And I'm not here advocating that one is better than the other. I, there was no, I'm agnostic as to what a client may or may not want to do. This is just more of an educational and informational uh, you know, perspective. And so uh, when you get a loan from a bank, you typically have to present a full financial package because we are looking at not only the IP, but we're looking at the cash flow that that IP generates. That's our ability to have you repay our loan. The actual IP is the what we would kind of maybe consider a secondary source of repayment in the event that the cash flow is not there. We would step in, and then we would we would own the we would own the IP, and we hope we never knock on wood. I don't know where wood is, but that's never happened in my career, and. Uh, and we try very hard to, to understand uh, the royalty stream and the future uh, of, of those royalty streams so we can structure a, a, a loan that's appropriate for, for the songwriter in, in, in particular. And, and that's quite frankly how John and I got our start was working with songwriters uh, and, and really figuring out how to monetize the writer share uh, and the performance yeah. royalties, and so yeah. I think that's a that's one. Th it's really important to understand when you come and talk to the bank. The bank is going to look at financial information from you. So, um, so that's a key a key point. Um, and then when you do an advance, it's a little bit different um, because typically you're getting that either from the PRO or the publisher or the label or the touring company, like wh wherever you may be. Um, and 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 that's really just going to be based on your earnings um, per, per se. And, and again, this is not um, you know, any sort of tax advice or tax uh, information, but when you, when you get a loan, the, the, the income is um, taxed on what you make in that particular year. The advance is typically you know, you're um, amortizing or you're, you're uh, projecting a, a future income over two, three, however long you're gonna get your advance for, so you get one lump sum. And, and so you're gonna pay the taxes on that one lump sum. And I think we've kind of heard that here uh, amongst all of us, the importance of preparing for taxes. Um, it's really, really, I, I cannot tell you, it's a cautionary tale that John and I saw a lot as, as lenders. Uh, people don't realize that you know, Uncle Sam will come right on in there and you know, bump everybody out of first position and you know, they, they they will be recouping your your money um, or your royalties until until you have paid your 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 taxes. So, just you know, two different tools, agnostic, but just understand you know kind of the the real key differentiators when you come to a bank. The bank is going to look at you holistically um, because we have to make sure that you can service your mortgage, your taxes, your insurance. Um, you know, you have fixed obligations, so we have to kind of take all of that into consideration with regards to a dollar amount that we can lend to you and your ability to pay us back. Thank you. And do you think there's a danger in some uh, songwriters and composers in thinking when they have an advance that they've already earned all of that money? That is, <laughs> that there are no other consequences? I, I, yeah, well, you know, then there's that. And, and you know, really, under, again, I think what everybody's been saying is to really understand what you're entering into and you know what are the pros what are the cons of that particular situation because when you get that advance that money is no longer coming to you that's going back to the person who gave you that advance and so one of the other things that John and I particularly when we worked together saw was somebody gets a big advance and then the first thing they do is they go out and buy a very expensive car a very expensive house and and you know, then they've got to go pay their taxes. And they're like, wait a minute, I was supposed to pay taxes? It's like, well, yes, you have to pay your taxes. <laughs> and and they, they don't realize that, you know, they're not getting any more income after they get that advance. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really important, as Mark talked about, is having a budget, understanding, I got in all this money, here's how much I owe t for taxes, here's what my fixed obligations are, meaning rent, you know, your car payment, insurance, and then here's the leftover, that if I have some leftover, 
you know, I can maybe go out and, you know, buy that, you know, uh, something that is not necessarily needed to, you know, meet your day-to-day -day needs. So, um, so yeah, that's some things to think about. Yeah, I think um, so oftentimes people have life, lifestyle appetites that don't always match truly what, what they can keep up with. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of you know a, a reality of saving for the rainy day because the rainy day, unfortunately, you know, as a banker, I'm supposed to be a, very much a pessimist. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the rainy day comes, and um, and and people are not necessarily prepared for it. And I think you know through what this event is trying to do, and and all of my panelists here is trying to do is to give you education and information because through having education and information, you can make better choices for yourself that give you financial freedom. And that's really kind of the undercurrent of why we all work, right? Regardless of where we come from is we want to be educated and informed and make good decisions so that when the rainy day comes, we're not stressed about it. It's like, oh yeah, I got some, got some money in savings, I'll go deal with that or, you know, the car broke down, I need to get a new car, I can deal with that. Um, you know, need a new roof, I can go deal with that. Um, so I think it's really important to really understand some of those, those impacts of you know, having a budget and, and saving for a rainy day. Absolutely. When establishing a relationship with a new client, what are the key factors in determining their financial goals and objectives? I, you know, this is a relationship business, um, very much so. So uh, really sitting down and getting to know someone is super important. You know, Mark talked a little bit about client selection. I, I, there is client selection as well in working with somebody like me. I, I want to be able to add value to who you are and what you do. And so, you know, hopefully through my knowledge and my many years of being in music, I can lend some insight into kind of what you're doing and how you're how you're doing it. And so it's really, for me, can I add value to what you're doing? Because there's lots of banks, there's lots of bankers out there, um, but I should be able to kind of give you some information, education uh, ab about what your needs are. And it's really just through a conversation, uh, getting to know you, getting to understand kind of what your likes are or how you like to spend money what's on your horizon, what have you already done. It, it, all of those kind of come into, into play, particularly when I'm making any sort of recommendation about how you should go forward, how you should structure, you know, just something, whether it's a checking account or is it a savings account. Um, you know, do you, as Mark talked about, figuring out, do they, should they have a 30-year mortgage? Should they have an interest-only mortgage? Like, what is the best structure and tool for you? And, and it's interesting because a lot of times I get pulled in because bankers don't really understand how you all make your money. You're not going to get a normal paycheck. And, and so really making sure that you can service the debt in the manner of which you're also getting paid is super important. And so that's another key point is I'm trying to really dig and figure out, like, how are you getting paid? When are you getting paid? Um, you know, as a songwriter, if you're with a PRO, you, it's four times, eight times. If you're, you know, an artist and you're just, you know, signed with your label, it may only be two times. I mean, so there's all these different pay cycles. And my job is to educate you about, okay, if you enter into doing something like this, you know, make sure you're saving because the bank is going to typically give you a, a monthly principal and interest uh, payment requirement and how are you going to service that if you're only getting paid twice a year or if you're only getting paid four times a year. So so that's, I think, just a deep dive. And, and we never get it through the first conversation. It's through mul multiple conversations. Um, and so I just really try to connect and get to know people. Yes, and how to budget for alimony, which we've... Uh, we've <laughs> Nobody gets across, divorced, come ever. <laughs> come across, yeah, never get divorced. That's my advice. Ever, ever, ever. Ever, ever. How do you, as the banker, interact with your client's team, their business manager, their attorneys? Very carefully. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's... Minefield. Yeah, no, actually, it's really lovely. And I always feel like I have one of the best jobs because I really do get to be in the whole 
ecosystem. So from dealing with people like yourselves, the songwriters, to your publisher, to to your attorneys, to your business managers, to your manager, who, whoever it may be, um, I just become part of that ecosystem and I try to complement the vision, the thoughts, the ideas, and, and provide my, my area of expertise. And so I have the good pleasure of kind of working with everyone in a very almost agnostic way because I'm really only there once the deals are done and you're, you've figured out how you're going to make your revenue. I'm there to kind of complement okay, now that you're gonna get all this money in, you know, here's what you should have for your day-to-day, -day you know, kind of think of it as operational money, here's some money you should put aside for savings, or maybe that's your down payment money. Um, and so I, I just really a compliment to the whole entire ecosystem. Okay, and we touched on this, but how do you address with a client the need for realism in terms of their budgeting and their lifestyle? Do you? How do you approach this topic, which can be a very sensitive issue for many artists? Yeah, it's a, it's a again, a very delicate discussion because, um, you know, uh, I think you've all have seen a lot of the headlines about, um, you know, catalogs being sold and sold for certain, you know, dollar amounts. And, and then a lot of times people would have decided they don't want to sell and, like, can you give me um, a loan? And... And, a, and debt is never going to unlock the same amount of capacity as a sale. And so kind of coming to realization with those new uh, numbers and, 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 and amounts. Um, and then when you kind of get to whether they sold or they monetize, whatever that dollar amount is, is explaining to them what they're going to have to do with that money. Like you have a responsibility now with that, with that money. And, and a lot of times particularly in a loan situation, clients will come to us and say, I can sell my catalog for X and I want you to give me that loan. It's like, well, no, I can't give you that dollar amount. I can give you this dollar amount. Um, and it's really hard for them to understand. I'm looking at you holistically and I'm telling you that when I look at you holistically, your financials are telling me you can only support this, this loan amount because I'm going to take into account your like I said, all of your fixed obligations. And sometimes people will understand what I'm trying to explain to them, and sometimes they just, they don't care. They're like, thank you very much, we appreciate it, and now I'm going to go out and, you know, buy that house or, or you know, buy all that art or jewelry or whatever it is that they feel so determined to do. So I try, I really do, and I try to tell the story through numbers. Uh, that is kind of how I communicate with, with clients about the realism of what they can and cannot do. I think those are wise words, and you have to stay grounded in your reality and, as Kay was saying, in your history. Because otherwise, the more successful you become, the more lost you become. Yes, so you need that grounding. And because not many people uh, talk to you about this, Denise, please tell us, a bit about the more complex structures that you enter into because City National is very involved in syndicated financing, catalog, acquisition financing, etc. And also for an exchange, for example, many artists these days, maybe they're getting euros, maybe they're getting yen. How do you structure those sorts of relationships? Sure. So, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned early, John and I really started out working with songwriters and monetizing the, the writer's share. And really, again, because it's such a, a community, uh, through word of mouth and referrals, we grew into working with publishers and providing credit facilities to publishers um, so that they can make advances to songwriters and, and uh, you, know, you know, monetize that side of the, the copyright as well. And um, and through working with publishers, we kind of grew into working with labels. And, and so it's just been this complete arc and, and evolution um, of our ability to provide capital to the entire industry. But it was not something that we just said we're gonna go do. I, I mean, it really has taken me almost 20 years to learn. Uh, I'm still a student, I'm still learning, um, but, but because we, uh, work with the whole entire industry, 
it gives us a very unique perspective on looking at different pockets so we can structure all different types of things. So, so uh, in particular, John and I launched the music vertical for the bank and we started out working with songwriters. And then in about 2016, I launched the syndications desk for City National Bank. And that, what that means is because the debt is so big, it's so large, that the bank doesn't want to hold all of that debt. So they're going to syndicate it out, meaning they're going to uh, pro prorate that to other banks. And so if you're doing a $50 million deal or a $75 million deal, you'll bring in other banks that will take different chunks of that, of that deal. And so, so we have the ability to grow with somebody who, from you know, a very you know, startup phase all the way to uh, getting into what we would even consider institutional lending where you're you know, looking at something from being offered on Wall Street, so to speak. So we can run that whole kind of complete uh, arc. And then again, John and I were always very big advocates on the international side of things because we, you know, really, when we were lending, when I'm still lending, you know, we're looking at lots of things in addition to how you're making your, your money. What are the contributors to making that money? There's the geopolitical landscape, and there's also just kind of the volatility with the FX as well. And so a lot of times if we've got clients that are, you know, making income or, uh, you know, receiving income in a certain uh, currency, we have tools to help you manage that foreign exchange. So we have what's called foreign currency deposit accounts where you can, you know, receive euros, you can send out euros, um, and it helps mitigate that that exchange and so and we and so we work with the whole industry on on a strategy around um, inter international as well. Thank you. Do you have any any other advice to give to our songwriters? I think, like everybody else said, uh, you know, in it, you know, I was taught this very early on as a very baby banker, um, and I think it rings true today. Inspect what you expect, you know. Uh, you know, you have to love your financial freedom as much as, you know, your business manager, your attorney, your banker. Um, so be involved, become educated, and ask lots and lots of questions. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> and Denise really has a love for creative people and, and passion for music. Um, so she's not just a disinterested, detached banker. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. John and I, one of the things we used to, because we both love music so much, and it was like we would work with a songwriter or we would work on a catalog, and we'd be like, oh, my God, we love this song. I can't believe we're working on this. And, you know, we would be all excited and talk about how much we love the band or we love the song. And then, you know, the minute you put some numbers in front of us, then the banker hat goes on. But our first reaction was always from a, a fan and appreciation perspective. So, yeah. And for Sona... Denise and John were the first sort of like big kids that, that gave us their stamp of approval that let us know, like you were the first corporate people that were like, we will support you. You were the first logos that we got to put on our events and, and, um, and told the world that we were real. And so we will always appreciate you for that. It's such a privilege. You, you guys were so dynamic. We're very eccentric corporate people. <laughs> <laughs> that you are, and we will always love City National Bank for that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd I'd like to uh, close off our session today with our Q and A session. So we'll let Ariel uh, take over. Um, I'm in a songwriting partnership of two. We currently just invoice projects half and half. One invoice from her, one invoice from me, both with our own social security numbers. Is there an income threshold above which we should create an LLC? I think this is gonna go to Mark, right? Maybe. They say that their combined income is under 100,000. Uh, I, I would say that, that you're not ready for an LLC yet. Because the LLC also requires the same amount of a, a, when I say LLC, I mean 
a, essentially a partnership, not a single member LLC. It requires the same amount of accounting that a corporation does because the uh, partnership returns, which is what an LLC return would be, they're very similar to corporate returns. You have to put on a balance sheet, which is your assets and liabilities. You have to list your, you know, your income and expenses, and it all has to balance. So I would say I would say wait on that. Forever, yeah. Um, do, who who asked the question? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, do you plan on being writing partners with this person for the long haul? Is this a one-off? Is it long haul? Long haul. It, but do you plan on writing with other people or? Yeah, polyamorous writing. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I, I would consider. This is this is a non CPA thing, but just in terms of like if you're going to be slutting around, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you know a loan out, right? Yeah, a loan out could work, but again, there's a dollar threshold involved with with, with, the, with the loan out. I would say oh. there's a dollar threshold with the, with the loan out corporation. So uh, while it makes sense from a tax standpoint. Uh, certainly, the costs at at that level are, are, it won't. It doesn't justify it yet. Okay, um, the situation I had talked about earlier with with Kay and her partners, they formed that for one particular project, that LLC, and it was a good structure. And then when I got involved, you know, I I, I tweaked it a bit to where I had their. Um, their own loan out corporations because they already had the corporations, it made sense to, to do it. But that was a somewhat of a unique situation. With, with the rise of AI and knowing that it, um, that it takes from active works, as we've seen in visual art, how do you expect this to play out in regards to songwriting infringement cases? Lindsay, I, guess I think this, this is for you. I guess this one's for me. This is actually a really active topic that both the Copyright Office is looking at, the music industry is looking at. We've actually been on calls with legislators and OpenAI that does chat GPT, talking about this exact thing, learning about how their technology actually works, like what do they do? Does it scan the internet? Do they create copies? Do they have a database that this... AI takes from and you know we're still all learning about it right now and trying to make sure that we move forward in a way that is not Napster right like we don't want to have another blow up we don't want to have another technology versus the music industry because that didn't go well for anyone at the time so right now we're still in you know the figuring it out phase and trying to see like where music industry's piece of the pie is when it comes to that and along with that, learning about how the technology works is also, okay, what features are you gonna put in place so that your AI doesn't spit out things that are just copies of somebody else's work? Like, is there going to be a way to say, oh, I'm a big songwriter and I don't want any of my work being, you know, used in the AI or it, it can't, you know, you can't go on and say, oh, I want you to write me a song in the style of Justin Bieber. Like, could Justin Bieber say, no, like, we don't want, you know, the AI to be able to use that function. So there's a lot of different nuances when it comes to AI right now that we're just, like, not quite there yet. Um, but then also on the copyright front, is, is AI going to have a copyright? Right now, the Copyright Office says no, only humans can have copyrights. So as far as, you know, today's legislation and today's laws are concerned, if you use AI to help you create a song, you have to disclaim all of the work that the AI did and only get a copyright in the work that you did. So if AI wrote the first line of the song, you wrote the second line, on and on, you only get copyright in what you put forward. So I think we're, uh, we're gonna see a lot of interesting stuff <laughs> coming out. <laughs> real soon uh, and you know we've got these Drake AI songs that just happened this week that's a big thing 
they're <laughs> Yeah, I think an AI, what, they like made it sound like Drake. I didn't even like listen to the songs. Yeah, Drake and The Weeknd. So that's another piece of AI. If uh, if that's an infringement on, I guess, the personality right, because it is a sound alike. And uh, it, it, there's a, it's, a fun, it's a fun space to be in right now. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer it? I don't even know. <laughs> Maybe tell us more about personality rights and what that encompasses. Yeah, so typically personality rights are like your name and your likeness, so or your your image. So that's pretty easy when it comes to your name. Like you can't write Britney Spears on a T-shirt and sell it because that's not your name. That's Britney Spears' name. Same with photos, likenesses. Uh, that could be like a painting of you or someone's character of you. Like you would still have the right to say, no, you're not allowed to use that in a commercial way. You can't sell a t-shirt. You can't put it on your song and sell your song. Like I've actually had, <laughs> we had one client that had a music sample pack that had his name on it. And so you could use samples that were made by this artist and somebody, <laughs> used one of the samples and then distributed it to Spotify, tagging the artist as like one of the featured artists on the song. And we were like, you, why did you tag him? And he's like, well, I used his sample. It's his work. And I'm like, no, like, that's not how this works. Like you were allowed to use the music, but you're not allowed to use his name to help sell your song. Like he did not help create this song. So that's kind of a, a weird example, but that's getting into the same kind of realm as the uh, Drake on your song, even though it's not really Drake on your song. Yeah. Where should an artist invest their time to create their largest return on investment? So this, um, this artist is looking at royalties, touring, merch, monetization, sponsorships, performances, sync and album sales, looking at all of that. So I think maybe Kay and Denise, maybe this is. So the question is, um, what would be the largest, What, where would they find the largest ROI? Which of those areas? Um, She says artist, and so, yeah. I mean, Joanna, do you want to clarify? Uh, yeah, who asked the question? Okay, so for a performer, like a recording artist? Yeah, I mean, seeing it's on the album, so how do you go for those Um. So, uh, I mean, merch is always the banana. Like, if you have great merch and you're touring, uh, that's always going to bring you <laughs> the most bang for your buck, if you ask me. And c repeat the question. You want to hear that list? Yeah, the that's whole the, list. Yeah, yeah. Give me the uh, whole thing. Royalties, touring, merch, monetization, sponsorship, performance, sync, and album sales. So, and then for songwriters, I mean, sync. Sync and work for hire. You know, I mean, so... To, in my opinion, if you are a performer who is able to tour, then you know being out touring on your own, you know doing, you know if you can if you can perform with a guitar or a keyboard and you can do that on your own in living rooms, then go do that and like have a bag full of merch and you are gonna make a killing and like have like a little square thing or you know just be able to just have point of contact payment, easy payment options, um, and great merch, and you are gonna be in great shape. And if you're a songwriter, and you can produce your own stuff, um, or you have like a team, then sync and work for hire. Being able to do music for picture is, music to picture is a great way to make a living. Um, those are the best return on investment, in, in my opinion. It's hard to separate it all because they all feed on each other. I, I mean, I have a recording artist. He makes a lot of money touring. And because he makes a lot of money touring, he has his own merch company. And they make a lot of money with, with the merch. And then there's the, uh, there's the, the, the songs themselves, you know, with, with, the, with the 
with the mechanicals, the, the streaming, uh, and all the other royalty streams, it, it's, it's, this, it's an enterprise, really. So, the Yeah, uh, I, I, I think touring is important for a recording artist. I, I, I really do. It's it start it starts the engine. You, you, have the ha you have the music, you go out, you perform. People want to hear it, then they want to buy it, and and then they get more interested in the merch. Yeah, just adding to that, like really building your brand and kind of seeing which avenue makes the most sense for you. We have clients that you know, bring in a lot of money on touring, stream their works really well, but have no merch business because they have no fan base really. Like they don't connect with their fans. So maybe you, know, you wanna make sure that you're connecting with your fans early and you know, putting your effort into like what makes sense for you. Obviously like that's working just fine for them. They don't need merch, like, it'll be fine. But it just depends on, you know. Your, you personally. And when we're talking about Sona, you know, songwriters of North America, we're not talking about recording artists. You know, recording artists have their own representation through through the Recording Academy and you know through radio through just fans. So, oh, um, and Sona, we're talking about the songwriter and which you know, songwriters don't tour, songwriters don't make, at least not yet. I mean, we're, we're really kind of working on that, trying to get to a point where songwriters have fans and songwriters walk the red carpet and songwriters are, you know, how, throw the parties and you know, are the, the bells of the ball. Um, but we're not there yet. So, um, so again, we, there are, it, it's kind of, we are limited in the ways that we can monetize our works. And, um, and you know, some of those ways that we classically have mon been able to monetize those works have disappeared, like radio airplay and album sales. So now, you know, sync and sync and work for hire, you know, music to picture is just a better avenue for that, just quicker. Better royalties. You guys are so great. Um, okay, this might be a Lindsay question. What is an MDRC in, in terms of contracts? So an MDRC is, I always get it wrong, minimum delivery and recording commitment. MDRC, yeah. Release, release, minimum <laughs> delivery and release commitment. Basically what it means is you'll have contract periods. Usually you start with one and then there will be several options. So maybe you get one plus three options. In an MDRC setup, in order to move to the next option, which by the way is when you get your next advance, you have to have delivered and released a certain number of compositions. And it's 100% of those compositions. So where you get into trouble with these is if you're not a solo songwriter or you're not in a band that has maybe two people, three people that write every song and you're writing pop, you're writing rap where you've got 10, 12, 15 songwriters maybe all you know, taking five, 10% chunks, you have to add up every single one of your chunks in order to make one whole song. So it might take you 10 songs being released to actually have delivered one song under your deal. And it's not gonna be that you have to deliver one or two, you have to deliver five, 10, 15 songs to get to your next contract period. So we're really trying to move away from that. And for the most part, we don't see those deals anymore, but that is one of those pitfalls that you'll get into that if you do not know what your deal is and you don't, you don't really understand what it means, you may say, oh, well, I just got $200,000. That'll easily last me a year, two years, but your contract period is gonna take five years. 
and you're not gonna have planned for stretching that $200,000 out until that next advance comes during your next contract period. So that's definitely one of the things that having good communication between the business managers, between your accountants, between your lawyers, so that everybody is looking at this from the beginning, like, okay, what kind of songwriter are you? How long do you think you're going to, you know, is it gonna take for you to make this minimum delivery requirement? Is this amount of money gonna last you that long? Do you have other sources of income, et cetera? So that's what that is. This person says, we've had music attorneys in the past. Other than referrals, how would you advise an artist or songwriter to find a music attorney who'd be interested in working with them? Referrals are generally good. You can get referrals from a lot of different places too. You can ask other songwriters that you, can, that you meet. You can ask your bank, your business manager. You can ask organizations like Sona. You know, there's lots of ways that you can find different music attorneys, but I would say kind of steer away actually from just Googling. You know, it's really best if you can find a referral from anybody. <laughs> Even if it's, you know, you get referred to, you know, maybe our firm and we say, oh, we're full, you know, right now we have a lot of clients, I'm sorry, but we can refer you to, you know, and we have a list. So even if you get referred to somebody that maybe can't take you, usually they will have then further referrals to pass you along to. And that's good because you know that somebody has vouched for them at least, right? Like it's not just somebody off the internet. And I would definitely say, <laughs> don't go to the lawyer that helped you get your divorce and <laughs> say, can you look at my music publishing contract? <laughs> or <laughs> don't go to the lawyer that got you out of jail and say, do you know how to do a recording agreement? Like, they don't. <laughs> Trust me, they don't. <laughs> Even if they say, sure, let me take a look at it. Like, they're not gonna know what they need to know, so don't accept anything less than an actual music attorney. That's my only caveat. This is a question about sync. Uh, does partnering with Song Trust or Riptide mean that approval for syncs need to run through them? Or can your songs still be considered one stop for sync pitching purposes? I know this isn't a sync focused panel right now, but. Yeah, I, th I think I know the question. Are you just saying, they're saying like, is do you have to get approval from them to do your own sync? Or does the sync go through song trust? I'm not sure the question. I think they're asking, um, they want their songs to be, uh, for sync purposes, considered w one stop for approval. But they're, they're asking if they partner through Song Trust or Riptide, is it no longer a one stop? No, I would still consider it one stop. Th those types of administrators, you retain all of your rights. Really what they do is they help you collect. So they're, they're not gonna add an additional layer of uh, approval you know, they don't, they don't care what you do with your music. They're really just there to help you go out and find, you know, royalties worldwide that you might not have been able to pick up yourself. Uh, they're like a, an administrator instead of a publisher. So they just take uh, and help you administer your works. But they don't, they don't usually like stop you from doing syncs. Not in any of the ones I've done. Did that get the question? Did we get the answer? Okay, there we go. Um, uh, this person is asking, I've been with TuneCore for 15 years, recently submitted my catalog um, to the MLC, and TuneCore is blocking the MLC from collecting. Any knowledge about that, TuneCore? paperwork is a big pain in the butt for the MLC, you know, their Excel document is very precise. 
And so anyway, I went back and forth with them. They accepted my document. This was maybe in December. And then it took a long time for it to show up in my account. I kept seeing that there were 51 songs. I called the NLC many times. And I said, I'm still at 51 songs. And they said, oh, it's going to populate. It's going to populate. And it just never did. And then I got uh, an email from them saying that TuneCore was saying that they had, I guess, essentially like first dibs to collect that on my behalf. And then I got uh, an email from TuneCore asking for my splits. Um, and so I was confused. And my question is, are they redundant services? I, I, I thought that they were not. I've been with, I mean, I've been with TuneCore for a long time, and their communication with artists is absolutely nil. It's just yeah. so not yeah. good. It's not transparent in any way. I, I, I can't see my Apple streaming royalties or anything like that. It's very, they're a big company, and their interface is really not so great. So I thought this would be a, you know alternative uh, revenue Yeah, there might have been a collection period. Hmm? There might have been a post-term collection period. Yeah. Have you spoken with anyone at the MLC? Or have you like spoken to a person or you're just doing email? Yeah, they are great. Hmm. Do you have an attorney? I do, but I took a long time. I think so. Yes. I yes. think that might be your, you might have to. <gasps> oh, okay. Yeah, that, that may be your only recourse is to call your attorney because clearly something is s still stuck. I'm sorry that's happening. That's really frustrating. But it, at least, uh, at least, you know, at least on the MLC side, stuff is, that's, it's good to know that stuff is working over there and that they're responsive and, yeah, they're really cool over there. So... And um, and congratulations on being so active in your career and in signing up for the MLC. Yay you! So everyone, be like this guy and sign up for the MLC. Call your lawyer immediately. How long is the timeline to pay back a loan? And I'll, let's see. There's another part here. Um, how can the bank support international earnings that take time to come in or structures that are still being formed to pro properly collect? You're going to have to probably repeat the second part of the question for me. Yeah, Your question, Ella? Yeah, so I can specify. Sure. Um, so, for example, like, um, like one part of business is that I bring in a lot from Asia. And so Spotify um, only came to a couple of different Asian countries in the last couple of years. And so there's of issues with um, retaining your earnings um, via streaming still. So, for example, like there's one deal now where we've done an advanced deal and we have a certain amount of monies that we know we're getting by you know different business management and lawyers accounting for what it is. But these um, self-publishing companies, because um, those structures weren't in place for streaming, um, they acknowledge that that lump sum is there, but they don't have a way So like, is the bank able to kind of bridge the gap for people who like have a certain, above a certain number, obviously it can be for everybody, but above a certain number of earnings and sort of like accommodate to people as they wait for those structures to be in place, I guess, if it takes a year or two. That's, 
That's a very long answer, but I'll try to, I'll try to, you know, yeah. d distill it down. So to answer your first part of your question, typically um, we're, we will look at uh, three to five year terms. And we're typically taking a look at what your earnings are going to be in the future. And we will take, you know, let's say you're making uh, $100,000 a year. And so if we wanted to take a look at, you know, pushing that out three or five years, that would equate to a loan of 300000 or, you know, 500000 And so that's just a very simple kind of, you know, calculation. There's how we ultimately land on the actual loan amount is when we take a look at what your financial wherewithal is and, and we figure out can you really support that, that loan. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we are taking a look at where is your income coming from um, and if it is coming from foreign territories, we already kind of know, particularly as songwriters, there is a lag with income from you know foreign foreign societies a lot of times or um, foreign sub-publishers. And so we do build that into, okay, you're going to get that. We have to look at your contract. We have to understand you know what what are those terms so that we can bank on that money eventually coming to the bank and making sure it's going to come to the bank during the term of our of our loan. But we try to, again, try to look at you very holistically. What are all your sources of income? When are you going to get them? And then we try to figure out like what's the best structure for you. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. Great. Thank you. How do you, so this is about um, streaming platform algorithms. How do you feel about the ghost typing and saturation of labels, distribution companies, and other companies using streaming farms to affect the streaming platform algorithms? Any thoughts on that? Can you repeat that? What are your thoughts about the saturation of labels, distribution companies, and other companies using streaming farms to affect the streaming platform algorithms. That sucks. <laughs> Any advice for it? <laughs> yeah. Any, anything else you want to say? Just basic, generally speaking, like anything that like the labels are doing to enrich themselves and screw over the anyone else's artists is just terrible, but same as it ever was. You like know. Don't be a faker and don't be a jerk. Yeah. Right? What is the streaming thing? <laughs> I think they're just trying to hype up the streams. So yeah. you know they're it's not authentic it's not authentic streams. Just it's trying not to real beat fans. the system. Yeah. And so is that also affecting, I mean, that is also presumably affecting pay. So it's just like. Yeah, I think they're cracking down on so it. So it's just like, it's it's hor it's horrible. Okay, Michelle's going to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to jump in on this. It's, it's terrible. It, it floods the zone. It, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the, the whole, all the streaming services pay the same amount. They all pay 15.1% now that we got the raise. Um, that's the, the, the weird misinformation is that streaming services pay different amounts. They don't. They all pay the same. The difference is the numerator. How much money it, you get is determined by, like, Tidal has such a better rate because they have fewer songs that they're paying out on. Anyone who's flooding the zone, like Spotify, just gets these, they do, they get flooded with kind of bogus copyrights that water down the payout. Does that make sense? The higher the numerator, the lower the payout is. The denominator is the same across all streaming platforms that are governed by the CRB in the United States. Does that make sense? So it's a terrible practice. Not good. Happens. We're trying to tr uh, create s like almost like tiers for um, kinds of streams, so that there'll be streams for, you know, the legit songs that are actual wholly new works that are streamed, and then ones that might be AI. 
so there might be th there might be tiers so that those will get a lesser payment than fully but that's what we're working on so it's a ter I, I had to, I'm sorry I had to like I know this answer <laughs> that's Michelle Lewis executive director of Sona <laughs> I think we just have two more here. Um, we've seen N NFTs and Web3 become a financially successful space for creatives and specifically songwriters. Do you expect that to continue and grow in the future? Additionally, what do you think is the best way to become part of that community? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, th I think it will grow. I think we're bouncing back finally from the tank that hit the crypto market last year, <laughs> it looks like it's kind of turning back around. So I don't think we'll ever see the uh, crazy NFT sales that you know we saw for the past few years. I think that was kind of a, a one-off bubble that might have burst, but you know, NFTs and Web3 aren't going anywhere. They're certainly like the next you know, forefront. They're the future of where technology is moving and the, you know, farther that we get into companies developing products for the music industry and getting stuff that is more consumer friendly, you know, you don't have to go out and create a wallet and do all these things that you don't know how to do. Um, the more consumer friendly that gets, the more revenue will be coming in from that space. So I think we can definitely expect like a lot more to come from that. I, and I would love to talk to you about this again and, and uh, you and I shared, we did an NFT and crypto. Um, <coughs> oh my God, was that a year ago? How long ago was that? I don't know. Yeah, it was a year ago that we did, uh, we did an NFT webinar um, or a lunch and learn. Uh, um, and uh, this was sort of uh, at the end of the high flying NFT days, but I think and I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on this, but I, I'm kind of failing to see where, um, you know, a future for music NFTs because there just isn't really a viable secondary market for them right now. And like, you know, what, what do you do with your music NFT once you have it? You know, you can't, sell it, you can't display it, you can't, you know. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of it's the... It's really, d it's kind of weird, it's, yeah, it's hard. That's the direction that I was kind of leaning towards, which there's a lot of companies right now that are working to develop music NFT products that are actually commercially viable, yeah. right? Like we're still very much in the idea phase for a lot of these yeah. companies, and so we haven't seen anything actually be put out but there's companies like pixel links that are working on you know basically ai where you get involved with uh more of a physical space you go out and collect stems you know labels can put stems out and and all of that anything with music is going to also come with the songwriting right you can't have music without a song so we're, we're not quite there. The technology right. is not quite there, but I've seen a lot of things that are really interesting and you know, as accessible as an app on your phone. Mm -hmm. And so if and when those technologies right. you know, actually come out and become publicly available, I think that'll be the point where we see like a real change. One thing that I did, one, one uh, project that brought me back into the NFT space recently was a collaboration between um, a group of women that a lot of you probably know, um, a songwriter, a bunch of songwriters, uh, Autumn Rowe, Erica Nuri Taylor, uh, Eden, uh, Soki Siren, a couple of other women got together and did a songwriting collaboration and they partnered with one of my absolute favorite vis visual NFT artists named Render Fruit, and they did a visual audio collaboration that was absolutely gorgeous, and they released an NFT on the Nifty Gateway plat NFT platform. And um, I think doing visual audio collaborations could be something, because at least you, know, you can display a visual NFT 
there is a way to do that and having like that audio visual, you know, having the, the visual component um, gives you something to, you know, something. But, but people that aren't really, they don't just, they just don't want, they just don't want to buy, uh, there's just no interest in a secondary market for music NFTs the way there are for visual, uh, visual art. So, um, so I think like music and visual art collaborations, like that, that, that is a way for songwriters to, um, to find some inroads into the NFT space still. Um, and I, I would definitely, you know, I'm still interested in that, not the way I used to be, but, um, but I really loved um, the, the uh, collaboration between the Sung Women and Render Fruit, and I'll keep an eye out for that stuff still. All right, last question. Any advice for independent artists who may not be pursuing deals? Any financial advice? For independent artists, I'm not? assuming that's like independent songwriter, artist, songwriter, singer, songwriters, who may not be pursuing. I'm assuming publishing deals is what they're talking about. Ooh. Who asked that, who asked question? that question? What are yeah. You, what are you getting at? <laughs> the mystery person. I love you, <laughs> and uh, good for you, <laughs> and uh, stay independent for as long as you can. I don't think you need, I, I don't think there's any need for any songwriter to have a publishing deal, or a label deal, or any deal at all with anyone. Um, I think that in this day and age, you can be a free agent. You could just just free ball it. You really can, um, and make you. If you have, if you have a team, if you have a really amazing attorney, if you have an amazing CPA, you have incredible writing partners. Um, you know whether it's you know your your co-writers in sync your co-writers with other artists, um, you have like great producers, whoever, it, you know, it's like you can, the sky is the limit and, and you can make all the deals that you need to. I just don't, I don't think you need to have those, I don't, oh, and having an amazing PRO, of course. Always have a PRO, get a PRO, but I don't think, I don't think you need to, that's just my opinion. My opinion. And, and plus, there's just a lot of DIY platforms, right, where you can go and you can have a lot of these services done done for you. And um, so that's another avenue to, to pursue as well. I, I want to say that uh, this is off the topic a little bit, but a lot of clients come to me and they'll say, uh, essentially, they, they come to me to help manage their finances and they'll say, Oh, I feel bad. I really should know all this stuff. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. Um, um, it's we all have our skill sets. Trust me. You don't want to hear me sing. You don't want to publish a song that I write. <laughs> <laughs> so my point in saying this is: don't feel bad. Don't let that inhibit you from asking the questions that are necessary for you to understand what you need to understand so that your finances are being managed properly. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up now. And thank you all for coming. We really appreciated your attendance. And we love our songwriters. As our introductory session of this four-part series, we sought to lay a broad foundation for the rest of the series. Coming later this year, session two will focus on building, managing, and very importantly, passing on personal and business wealth. Session three will be focused on building the value of your music catalog, which could be the largest asset that you have, the most valuable asset that you have. 
and session four will be dedicated to a discussion on diversifying your personal portfolio. Please follow the Sona Foundation on social media. And thank you to our panelists. You're all wonderful. And I want to thank again our program sponsor, Denise Coletta and City National Bank for their support of Sona and the Sona Foundation for eight years. And thank you, Barbie Quinn. I know she's here somewhere. And BMI for sponsoring the presentation at their glamorous offices here in the Rolex building here in Beverly Hills. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, John.